Romans 5. Romans 5. Let me read verses 12 through 21. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those sinning was not like even though over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one's trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass has led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be called righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can't deny who we really are. You know, but that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't try, especially when we're in trouble. Consider the story of Darren. Darren was a young man from Illinois. He was wanted on, a charge of, on charges of possession of a controlled substance with the intent to deliver. Darren was guilty, and he was on the run, and the law was pursuing him. One day, the police actually caught up with him outside of an apartment community known for drug trafficking, and when they approached him, they asked him who he was. Darren, knowing he is guilty, and he knows he has no escape, so he tells them the name of someone else. He says, I'm John Henry Jones. The police don't argue with him. They don't even have to. They just point to the tattoo on his arm that just says, Darren, all over it. Talk about tattoo regret, right? Um, And Darren tries to cover up, and he goes, no, that's the name of my girlfriend, but... He couldn't fool the police. They arrested him, and they took him into custody, where he would pay the punishment that his lawbreaking deserved. Darren could claim all he wanted that he was the innocent John Henry Jones, but his true identity was as plain as the tattoo that was on his arm. He was Darren, the lawbreaker. And no matter how much good Darren tried to do after breaking the law, he would always be Darren, the lawbreaker. And no matter how much good he did, he couldn't go back and unbreak the law that he had broken. The law would pursue him until he paid the debt that he owed. You see, you and I are not so different from Darren. Some of us have broken laws of the land, and some of us haven't paid our debt to society that we owe, and the law is after us. And it will continue to be after us until we pay up. But whether you have broken the laws of the land or not, all of us in this room Scripture says, are guilty of breaking the laws of God. See, what that means is that we're all guilty, and no matter how much good we do from this day forward, it will never undo the fact that we have broken the law. We are guilty, and we will remain guilty until we pay the debt that we owe. See, what that means is, if you're here this morning, and the only reason you're here this morning on a weekly basis is because you are somehow trying to cover up the fact that you did something you shouldn't have done, it's not going to work. It won't work. If you are here and you're giving 
from this point forward to somehow cover up the fact that you were somewhere where you shouldn't have been? It's not going to work. For those of you who are thinking that it's, now I need to be nice to strangers or maybe on a monthly basis go into a homeless shelter and serve there to outdo the fact that you are mean to your loved ones, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. You and I, according to scriptures, are lawbreakers. And as such, all of us are guilty. And it means because we are lawbreakers, the law will continue to pursue us until we have paid the debt that we owe to God. It's a pretty bad situation. In fact, that's a terrible situation. The question is, how did we get ourselves into this mess? Because it's too late now. All of us have screwed up. And more importantly, the question is, is there a way out? Is there a way out of this mess? The text that we read in Romans 5 answers both of those questions. And the way it goes about answering those questions is telling us the story of three choices. There are three choices that are presented in this text. And we're going to look at those three choices this morning. There's the first Adam's choice. There is the second Adam's choice. And then there's our choice. And we're going to look at these choices, but it's a little difficult because... If you were reading along with me, this text is really hard for us to understand. But if you follow it through, you'll see something incredibly beautiful in this text this morning. So let's begin and look at the first Adam. The setting of the first Adam was in a garden. It was in a garden called Eden. In Genesis 2, God created man out of the dust of the ground and he placed him in a paradise called Eden. And in that garden, God created trees to grow from the ground up with fruits all over it. He created things that were pleasing to the eye. He created things that were good for food. He not only provided all of this for Adam, but he also gave Adam a job to be responsible over this. He also gave Adam a wife. Today, the only thing that was missing would have been an iPhone. He had everything else. And God in the garden, gives Adam a command in paradise. And he says this in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He says, you can eat of any tree in this garden. You can eat whatever you want. You can enjoy life here. But there's one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. See, what God has just done here is that God has just entered into a covenant with Adam. Adam becomes the mediator of that covenant for all of the rest of humanity. We will find that out later in Scripture. And when God enters into a covenant with his people, he always does so through a mediator, a representative. Adam is that representative. What that means is that if Adam keeps this covenant, then everyone he represents will share in the blessings of his obedience. But on the flip side... If Adam breaks the covenant, what that means is that everyone represented by Adam, all of humanity, you and I, will share in the curses of his disobedience. That's the setting. What's the decision that he ultimately makes? Well, into this paradise enters a serpent. And the serpent likes to tempt. He's a tempter. We find out later in Scripture that the serpent is Satan himself, the tempter, comes to Adam and Eve, and he says to Eve, did God actually say that you can't eat from all the trees? Did God say that? Did God say that you can't eat of this tree? See, Adam and Eve are now faced with a choice, with a decision that they have to make. Will they choose to trust that God is good and that he doesn't withhold good things from them? And will they continue to obey God? Or will they choose... On the other hand, to believe that God isn't so good and that God isn't so gracious as he seems and maybe he's withholding something good from us and we'll just circumvent God's law and sneak around him because we want everything good for ourselves. See, that's the decision that Adam and Eve are faced to make and the reality is that's a decision you and I are faced to make every time we are tempted. Every time we're tempted to sin, it's a decision of do I trust God that he's good and he's given me everything that I need? Or do I think that God's not trustworthy and I need to disobey him so that I can fulfill my own happiness? That's the decision that you're faced with. These are the only two options that you have. Will you trust that God is good 
and that he hasn't withheld anything good from you? Or will you believe that God has withheld something from you and you can still get it yourself? You just have to disregard what God says. That's at the heart of every temptation that we face, every single one. What does Adam and Eve do? We learn in Genesis 3 that Eve took of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Such a small thing. I don't know why, but we had apples sitting outside this morning, and I was like, it fits perfectly into this story. It's like such a small thing, eating of a fruit. But Adam failed the test. Adam had just broken the covenant, not only for himself, but for everyone that would come after him. There's an Old Testament scholar by the name of Derek Kidner, and he reflects on this passage, and he makes a statement, it should be in your notes, it's so simple, the act, so hard, it's undoing. God will taste poverty and death before the words take and eat actually become verbs of salvation. To say that this act was disastrous is a major understatement. To see the results of what happened, we need to look at the passage that we re- just read in Romans 5. Romans 5, 12, Paul tells us the result of this. In verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Through this one man, Adam, sin came into the world. In other words, the toothpaste has left the tube. You can't put it back in. There's no way to get it back in. Undo what it's done. And with it comes death. You see, that's clear enough. You can look around the world that we live in and see that this is a world of cemeteries, isn't it? But there is something somewhat perplexing about this statement that Paul makes here. He says that death spread through all men because all sinned. What does it mean that all sinned? Does it mean that, like Adam, we all who have come after Adam, we also sin and subsequently we also die? Is that what it means? Or does it mean that when Adam sinned, as your representative, you also sinned in him and with him before you even existed? I'll tell you, as hard as it is to get your mind around, it's the second part that's true. And I'll show you why here in a second. He goes on in verse 13, he says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. We could all agree on that. We can see the story of Cain and Abel. We see the story of the flood and all the sin that was going on in the world. Sin was in the world before God gave Moses the law. But he says that sin is not counted where there is no law. If sin is not counted where there is no law and death comes through sin, then between the time of Adam and Moses, no one should have died. But look at verse 14. It says, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Even over those, between the time of Adam and Moses, death reigned. On what basis? On the basis of the fact that all of humanity was represented in Adam, and when Adam sinned, we all sinned. That's why. See, this is difficult for us to grasp. And the reason is we don't totally get the idea of a covenant and a covenant representative. But that is exactly what Paul goes on to talk about in the rest of the passage. You can look at verses from 15 to 19, and he says over and over again, it's through one man that sin has come. It's because of this one man's action that we're suffering. Through this one man who is your representative, in whom and through whom you sin and you fell. Football season's starting, so you've got to expect a football analogy somewhere along the way, right? Um, the idea of a covenant representative is more like a football game rather than a golf game. Here's how. In a golf game, if a golfer breaks the rule and you make an infraction, the only one that suffers is the golfer himself. He's the only one that suffers. But in a football game, there's 11 other players on the field with you. If one of those players trespasses, right, crosses across that line before the ball is snapped, then all 11 men on that team have to go back 5 yards or 10 yards. 
They all do. Adam is our representative. And when he trespassed against the law, all of us, represented by him, suffered the consequences of that action. He was our representative. His action was ours. Here's the hard part. What that means is that before you and I were born, we were sinners, even before we were born. We weren't born innocent. We were born sinners. And I know you're thinking, wait a second. I didn't even do anything. How can I come into this world guilty? That doesn't seem fair at all. Well, take heart. Because every time you do sin, you are just confirming Adam's choice as your representative. Every time you sin, you are saying along with Adam, yes, God is a God who cannot be trusted. If I want what is good, I have to go around God and get it myself. Paul says in Romans 2 that it's on the basis of that that we will be primarily judged. But that is so hard for us to get. Paul says in another place in Ephesians 2, something that's if you read it and you understand it, it sounds offensive. He says in Ephesians 2 that we are by nature children of wrath. By the very virtue of being born into this world as a son and daughter of Adam, you are destined for God's wrath. See, this is why I don't have to teach my children to sin. I don't have to teach them to be bad. They've got that part figured out all by themselves. It might be my genes, whatnot, but they've got that part figured out. I don't have to teach my son to go hit his sister when he doesn't get his way. He knows how to do that on and of himself. I don't have to teach my two-year-old to throw a hissy fit in the middle of Walmart when I don't buy him candy. I don't have to teach him those things. But I do have to spend time teaching him how to be good. I have to teach him how to obey. I got to teach him how to be nice. Those are the things I have to teach him. The sin and the evil, the stuff that comes out, they just come out, right? No one had to teach you to get angry when someone crosses in front of you and when you're driving, cuts you off. No one had to teach you that. No one had to teach you to get angry when someone says something against you. No one had to teach you any of these things. Jesus says all of that comes from inside here. It comes from your heart. Out of your heart, it comes jealousy and anger and lust and all this stuff. All of that stuff is already inside of you. It just comes out when other people expose it. Jesus says you already have it. They come right here because you are by nature a sinner. And because you're by nature a sinner, you consequently sin. I remember when Tim was like, a year old. I didn't know if he would understand what I was saying, but he would go to the outlets and try to touch it, right? And I'd be like, Tim, don't touch it. And he would look at me and crawl away from it. But then I was watching him. He would slowly crawl to the outlet, turn around, look at me to see if I was looking. Totally understood what I said. And if I wasn't looking, he was trying to reach. But if I was keeping my eyes on him, he wouldn't touch it. I didn't have to teach him to be sneaky around his parents. Those things we do by nature. That is our nature. Listen, that's terrible news. We are guilty. We are under the verdict of guilt. All of humanity after Adam is under the verdict of guilt and judgment because we are all covenant breakers. Thankfully, Adam isn't the only mediator that we have. In verse 14, Paul tells us that Adam was the type of one who was to come. Adam is a shadow that, fo- that points us forward to a greater reality, one that is true, one that is better, one that's coming later. And so we come to the choice of the second Adam. See, under the first Adam's representation, we're all alike. We're covenant breakers. The covenant cannot be unbroken. We can't go back and unbreak it. So apart from God's mercy, we have no hope. But God is a merciful God. And immediately after Adam and Eve fall, God sets this plan into motion whereby he's going to now establish a new covenant. And he's going to appoint a new covenant mediator. And this mediator is Jesus himself. See, just like Adam, Jesus came into this world in a very special way. Adam was created from the dirt by God's own very hands. Jesus was divinely conceived in the womb of Virgin Mary. He will be the head of a new humanity, created by the Spirit of God. And what does the second Adam do? Well, like the first, 
he has to keep the covenant. And let's consider the setting in which Jesus has to do this. The first Adam had to keep the covenant. He just had to do one thing. Don't eat of that one tree. If you don't eat of that one tree, you and everyone after you will enjoy and experience the blessings of obedience. But Jesus, the second Adam, doesn't have just one law to keep. He has the entire law to keep. And Jesus, we know, throughout his whole life, perfectly kept the whole law of God. That means to put it in a nutshell, from his birth till his death, he perfectly loved God with all of his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength, and he perfectly loved his neighbors as himself, his whole life with his whole life. But we come to the greatest test that Jesus will ever face at the end of his life. And this too was a test of obedience. Will he obey God or will he not? And consider the difference between the test that Adam faces and Jesus faces. See, otherwise you won't understand what happens in this other garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam has to not do one thing. And if he doesn't do this one thing, he gets everything. Obedience for Adam cost him nothing. By obeying, he gets everything. But Jesus, on the other end, by obeying, it'll cost him everything. Obedience means that he will pay the sin debt that we all owe on his body. Because this is so hard for us to imagine and understand. I'm going to try to bring this down to a level or an example that all of us can understand. The difference between Adam and Jesus is like this. Think about a father who brings his son into his room and says, listen, today, if you don't just, if this entire day, if you don't hit your sister, if you are, be nice to her and not hit her, that's all I'm asking you, don't hit her. If you, are, if you don't hit her, when I come home today, I will take you out for dinner to wherever you want to go. And then we'll go to the park and you can play for however long you want to play. And then after we're done playing at the park, we'll go get some ice cream. And after we get ice cream, we'll come home and we can pick whatever movie you want to watch and we can watch it all night long. You don't, there is no curfew for you tonight. Tomorrow, you don't have to make your bed. All you have to do is don't hit your sister. That's all you have to do. That's the test that Adam had. Here's the test that Jesus had to face. The father calls the boy into the room and he says, listen, I know that your sister keeps punching you in the face today over and over and over again. I know that she keeps making fun of you. I know that she keeps taunting you and making your life miserable. But if you would continue to turn the other cheek, if you would continue to extend forgiveness, if you would continue to extend mercy, if you will continue to love her and bless her, then at the end of the day, here's what I'll do. I will go and take her out for a great dinner. She will get to eat wherever she wants to eat. Then we will go to wherever she wants to go. She can get her nails done. She can do whatever she wants. She will get spoiled. She'll come home and we'll have ice cream together. Then we'll watch a movie together. She can stay up all night. We can do whatever you, she wants to do. And I'm going to have you stay home and you are going to be grounded in her place for the beatings and the tauntings that she gave you today. Take that to the millionth degree and you'll understand what Jesus did for us. You'll understand the difference between what Adam did and Jesus did. This is why when we come to the Garden of Gethsemane, remember Adam was tested in the Garden of Eden, Jesus was tested in the Garden of Gethsemane, we understand the struggle. Matthew 26 tells us what happens in the Garden we read that on that night that Jesus was going to be portrayed, he goes into the garden to pray and he falls on his knees before God and he says, God, if it is possible, would you take this away from me? If there is any other way for us to save humanity, let's do that. Don't let me go die like this. And then he gets up and he walks to his disciples and he comes back and he prays the exact same prayer a second time. And he pleads, God, if this will pass for me, let it pass. I don't want to do this. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And then he gets up, goes to his disciples and comes back a third time. And he prays those same words again. But now he's resolved. He'll obey. 
He will, in the face of everything that it's going to cost him, he will continue to trust that the Father is good. He will continue to obey. So we read that on the night that he was betrayed, that night that he was falsely accused by people, that night that he was handed over to the Romans to be stripped, humiliated, beaten, shamed, taunted, and ultimately crucified. And yet it's still not over. Because even as he's hanging on the cross, Jesus is still being tested. Even on the cross, he's still being taunted. One of the voices that calls out to him from the cross sounds just like the voice in the first garden. Listen to what one of the taunters say to him while he hangs on the cross. He says, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him. If God is really trustworthy, God will let him go. Do you see how that's very close to what the serpent was saying in the garden? Surely God can't be trusted. Surely God wouldn't allow you to go through something like that. But Jesus continues to trust God. See, whereas Adam failed to trust in the goodness of God in the midst of all of God's blessings, Jesus continued to trust God even when God himself forsook him. That is how much greater Jesus is. That's how much greater our Savior is. Jesus obeys all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's why death couldn't hold him. That's why after three days, Jesus is raised up from the dead. Not just raised up, but he is now raised all the way up, exalted at the right hand of the Father, where one day every knee will bow, and one day every tongue will confess that he is Lord. This is the second Adam. This is Jesus. Where are the results of what Jesus has done? We go back to Romans 5, where Paul tells it, spells it out for us and he, when he compares these two Adams. He says in verse 15, the first result that we receive from Jesus is that we have a free gift. Verse 15 says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. The gift that Jesus gives is not like the trespass that Adam committed. What Adam did when he was seeking something just for himself, he tried to take something just for his own self at the expense of all of humanity. But Jesus gives up himself in order to give all of humanity a free gift. But there's more. The gift that he gives is a pardon for guilty sinners. Verse 16, the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. The free gift following many trespasses brought justification See, they had different results. The works of the first Adam and the works of second Adam, namely, Adam's work brought condemnation to us. It brought judgment to us. But Jesus and his work brought us forgiveness and justification. The free gift that Jesus gives you is pardon for all of your sin and all of your law-breaking. The word justification is a legal term. That means all of Christ's works has been credited to your account. So that when the judge looks at you, he doesn't just see a blank state, but he sees this man that was righteous. He sees this woman that was righteous. That's Jesus' record being put into your account. That's what Paul is saying here. That because of what Jesus did, when God looks at you and when God looks at me, he doesn't see all the sins that we've done. He doesn't see all the mistakes we made. He sees Jesus. And he treats us as if we lived the life that Jesus lived. Think about how much greater Jesus' work is than Adam. Adam did a very powerful thing in a sense. Through one sin, all of humanity dies. That's powerful. This one man screws up and all of us are suffering. But it says Jesus, after many, many, many sins, through one act of righteousness, makes us right with God through one act of righteousness. Not just after one sin, but after all of our sins. Through his one act, he brings full pardon, full righteousness credited to your account. Listen, that's the power of grace. That's the power of God's grace in your life. We're justified even though we screw up over and over again. And that's not all. The Bible says that another part of the gift is that we will reign with him in verse 17. In other words, you're no longer subject to death. You no longer have to fear dying, but you're 
will reign with Jesus forever. This is the power of God's grace. Sin conquers, but listen, grace conquers sin and death. But that's not all. In verse 18, 19, he says, Therefore, as one's trespasses led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act led to justification. For by one man's disobedience we were made sinners. By one man's obedience we were made righteous. Here's the point he's getting at. Remember earlier we were offended when I said we didn't do anything? And even before we were born, God considered us guilty? This is where the good news of the gospel comes in. Purely by association with Adam, you are guilty. You're under judgment. But the Bible says that purely by association with Jesus, you're innocent. You say, wait, I didn't contribute anything to be called a sinner initially. Can I suggest to you, you also didn't contribute anything to be counted a child of God. You didn't do anything. You were declared righteous. Before you did anything good, that's the power of grace. That's the power of Jesus working in your life and my life. This is the result So we considered the choice of the first Adam, we considered the choice of the second Adam, now we come around to our choice. Here's the setting. Every single human being, every single person in this room, you're either represented by Adam or you're represented by Jesus. There are two covenants essentially, the covenant with Adam or the covenant with Jesus. You are not your own covenant mediator. God did not make a special covenant with you. You are either in Adam, represented by him, or you are in Jesus, represented by him. If you are in Adam, that means what you are saying is that you are a lawbreaker. The law will pursue you, and it will hound you until you pay the debt that you are owed, that you owe before God. That will be both here and in eternity. But, on the other side, if you are in Christ, what that means is you are pardoned. It means you are counted righteous. It means you are accepted. It means you are forgiven. It means you are loved. It means you belong to Jesus. It means you have been given eternal life and you will reign with Jesus forever and ever and ever. These are the two choices that are before you. These are the two choices for every man and every woman. And so we come to the decision, who will be your representative? Who will be your representative? Let me be clear here. Christ becoming your representative doesn't happen by you trying to keep the law from this point forward. I'm not telling you that what you need to do is start obeying all this stuff and then Christ will become your representative. That would be called good advice, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is good news. It's about something that's already happened. It's about something historical that is now actively working in our lives. And What is done is that Jesus has paid the full debt for all of his people. And now that's a gift that he offers us. How does one, being represented by Jesus so that we could have forgiveness, how can one become represented by Jesus so that we could have forgiveness and life and life eternal? It's not for everyone alike. Paul gives us a clue in verse 17. He says, Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. A paycheck is something you earn. You do your work, you get paid. You earned it. But what Jesus is offering here is not a paycheck. This is you coming to Jesus with all of your sin, all of your brokenness, all of your screw-ups, with your hands wide open, hands of faith, And Jesus gives you his righteousness freely. Not based on anything that you do or will do, but he freely gives it to you. And we come and we say, God, I want your righteousness. I want your gift of pardon. I want your life that you offer me. I receive you as my representative. So you can make that choice today and you will discover that if you choose Jesus, that even... The reason that you choose Jesus is because he was working in your life. He's working in you. He's drawing you to him. 
Do you see how clear the choice is? You can choose death and condemnation and guilt and judgment. But you could choose that when you're offered life and forgiveness and freedom. That's the choice that we have. I recognize that most of us in this room have already chosen Jesus to be our representative. So let me quickly remind you who are followers of Jesus the result of that decision today. Let me remind you the result of the gospel working in your life. First of all, because Jesus is your representative, you're not guilty. You are not guilty. See, even after we become Christians, we still screw up, do we not? We still break the law. We still sin. We still experience guilt. But after we become Christians, we don't have to pretend we're not guilty anymore. We can simply confess it to God and know that we're not guilty anymore. We don't have to deny who we are. We can be. We can be honest. We can be honest both with God and we can be honest with each other. We can say, I've sinned. Thank you, Jesus, that my sins are paid for. Thank you that because you died, I am not guilty. See, some of you in this room are incapable of feeling guilt today. All the stuff I talked about, and you still don't feel in your heart that you really are guilty. To you, you ha I ha say to you, you have to, according to God himself, on the basis of Adam's work alone, regardless of what you've done or haven't done, you are guilty before God. You are. But some of you in this room simply cannot believe that you are not guilty. To you, I say the same thing. On the basis of what Jesus did for you, you are not guilty. You have to believe, Scripture says, about the work of the second Adam. You either have all of Adam or you have all of Jesus. If you have all of Jesus, you are not guilty today. So confess the sin. Let it go. Leave it behind. Move forward. Trust that it's been forgiven. You are not guilty. Secondly, you are not condemned. Basically the same thing I said before, but it's worth saying twice. There is no more condemnation. After you fall into sin and you forget that God is good and you forget that God can be trusted and you go the other way, it doesn't mean that you have to condemn yourself anymore. You're not condemned. You're forgiven. Third, you reign in life. We all already reign, Paul says. And finally, your sin will always be less than God's grace. Your sin will always be less than God's grace. Listen, you will never, never out -sin the grace of God in your life. You'll never do that. You can never do enough to overcome what Jesus has already done. Sin is strong. But grace, is amazing. Sin is powerful, but grace is incredible. The grace of God. See, I can't tell you enough about it. I try to think about how to put it in words, but I can't do it. Listen to what Paul says in verse 20. The law comes in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abound it all the more. Here was sin coming in, and sin's coming in, and sin is coming in, and our sins are piling up, and it's not that grace just came and came alongside of it. It's no, bam, grace came, and we're now new. Grace just popped on the scene and completely changed you and me. The grace of God. Listen, when grace grips your heart, when you are, realize that you are living under the grace of God, you can't just talk about it. That's why we sing about it. That's why from ages, songwriters have written songs over and over about God's grace. And you can't just talk and you can't just sing about it. That's why you live it the grace that was offered to you, you now extend to other people. Because you know, and I know, that we don't deserve it. 
We don't deserve this love that we have received. We don't deserve this grace that we've received. And now we can freely offer grace to other people. Why? Because he loved me. Grace. Grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Listen to these words of an old hymn. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praises begin? Taking away my burden. Setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus, it reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, even for me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, O oh, magnify and precious name of Jesus, praise his holy name. I don't know about you, but when I think about the grace of God, it draws me into worship. Because you don't know me like I know me. You don't know my impure thoughts and you don't know my struggles and you don't know my sins. But he does. And even though he does, he still gives me grace. He still gives me grace. And I don't know you and I don't know your struggles, but you do. And he does. And you might sit in here and feel like I'm not worthy of it. And scripture says you're right, you're not. Because you can't earn it. It's not given to you because of what you've done. This is the gift of Jesus. Why are we studying these Old Testament characters? Because these Old Testament characters show us how amazing our Savior is. Adam, through his one sin, brought sin and destruction to us and condemned us as sinners. Jesus, through his one act of righteousness, has now made us right with God forever. This is the grace of God. This morning as we come to the communion table, I want you to examine your heart. Would you examine, are you trusting God that what he says is good, that he is trustworthy? Or do you think that God somehow is holding things back from you and that you could sneak around God because you don't trust God? Are you represented by the first Adam? Or this morning, do you sit here represented by Jesus? And let me say this. If you are represented by the first Adam, that grace that we've talked about, it's available for you today. You don't have to do much. There's no formal procedure. It is you saying, Jesus, I want you to be my representative. And I invite you, if that is you, would you pray that prayer today? Would you make Jesus your representative? Would you let him change you? The rest of you in this room, this table that we celebrate is a reminder of the grace of God in our lives that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. So when we come to the table, the way that we do communion here at Lost City, David's about to sing a song, and we're going to let you reflect on the words of the message this morning. Whenever you are ready, you are welcome to come and grab the elements, and then I will come up at the end, and we will partake of communion together. But let's just spend some time meditating on the grace of God and reflect how good 
and worthy he is. Let's worship.